Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. It is very important that you and I have a proper perspective, that we see things from the vantage point of God, that we have His mind and His understanding of His Word. This is what illumination of the Holy Spirit brings to us, that we would be equipped to know and to act. And if we don't understand the power and the authority of this new covenant, if we don't understand it correctly, then we're not going to be the ministers of it that God desires that we should be. Take out your Bible and look with me to 2 Corinthians and chapter 3. Paul's second epistle to the congregation at Corinth and chapter 3. Now, we're going to bring up this chapter, and we're going to see that this chapter is full of information concerning our faith. And what Paul is saying here is that he is an apostle. There are others with him, like Titus and Silvanus and Timothy that, that minister and serve with him. And he wants others to understand their call, and the methodology that they use. And their methodology is founded upon truth. Notice how he begins. Now, we need to remember that the last thing that Paul said as he concluded chapter 2 is that he made a distinction between himself and others. In fact, he says the majority and I believe the way it's written, he's speaking about the vast majority. Those who engage in something related to the gospel. He's saying at this time, the majority were peddlers. They were not sincere. They did not bring a transparency to their work. But they had wrong motivations, wrong objectives. They saw the ministry of the Word of God as a means to achieve financial blessing, financial prosperity. And that's why he says, we are not like the most peddling the Word of God, but he says, in simplicity, in sincerity, with transparency, he ministers as though he stands in the very presence under the watchful eye of God. And he does so in behalf of Messiah. Now, with that in mind, notice what he says in chapter 3. He is going to validate his call and the methodology of his ministry through these individuals at Corinth. Paul is very pleased on how God is moving in this congregation. Now, I've said many, many times, Corinth is a very ungodly place, a place of great immorality, injustice, where those who visit there came for the purpose of the gratification of the flesh, not in any way wanting to submit to the standards of of God. And Paul is speaking about his call, his ministry, and he says, look at verse 1. Are we beginning again to commend ourselves? Meaning, are, are we trying to validate our, our ministry, our call as apostles, as servants of, of Messiah? He says, this is not my 
objective. I am not writing in order to recommend ourselves, to give ourselves a stamp of approval. He says, rather, there's something else that people should, should consider. And what is that? He says, nor do we have need as some of epistles, that's letters of recommendation unto you. He says, we don't need that. Why? Look at the last part of verse 1. He says, rather from you is our stamp of approval, our recommendation. Now, what he's talking about is this. One can judge Paul and those who are serving with him by how this congregation in Corinth is behaving. He says the proof, the validation, the condemnation, the support, the stamp of approval for his work is seen in their testimony. And that's why Paul says last week, you are the ones that, that we rejoice over. You're a source of joy for us because we see the work of God, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, in this congregation, in those individuals at Corinth. So he says, we don't need, again, to write letters of recommendation, support, to validate us, because you, you, the way you live, your testimony, are epistles of recommendation for us. Look now to verse 2. He says, our epistle, our letter, and he's not using it, in the same way as these epistles that he wrote, but words of support. A, a letter that one would bring to commend themselves to others. He says, our epistle is you, having been written in our hearts. What Paul is saying is, it is our love for you, our thoughts for you that we hold so dearly in our, our, our hearts that we, we find our, our validation before others, our testimony. So he simply says that. Look again at verse 2. Our epistle is you, having been written in our hearts, having been known, people can see it and make, make their own determination, and they can read it by watching how this group behaves. So he says, which has been made known and has been read by all individuals, all people. Now, does that mean everyone has seen that? No, but everyone who has come in contact, who has knowledge of, who's heard about, who's viewed this congregation, they have that testimony. They have that proof, that validation that what Paul and others who are with him are doing is bringing about producing legitimate fruit, things that are pleasing to God. Now, again, I mentioned earlier where Paul is going to go in the second half of this third chapter. For many, it's going to be controversial. He is going to say some very strong things to, to us tonight and through this epistle that he wrote so many years ago. And it is the fact that this congregation is living out faithfully the call, the faith that they have received that validates what Paul is going to say. Now, obviously, what he's saying comes to us. We need to affirm this. It comes to us by means of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All Scripture is given by inspiration. It is profitable, that is the Word of God, for us that we might be equipped for every good work. So this is Scripture. But when it's being written and received by others, they, they it had not been canonized, not part of a, a book, the Holy Bible at that time. So Paul is saying, what I'm sharing with you, it has validation because our ministry, 
The, the proof of it is seen in this congregation. So he says, you are our epistle. Look now to verse 3. Manifesting because you are an epistle of Messiah. He says this validation, this condemnation, commending would be a better way to say it, this commending of their ministry is, is an epistle that they represent their lives. But it's founded, he says, of Messiah that, that has been ministered by us. Now, this word, ministered, has an idea today of someone who is a, a broker or an agent. A broker, for example, who purchases, for example, stocks and bonds. It's the broker that puts it into effect. Same thing with an insurance. An agent is the one that puts it into effect, makes this insurance valid. And what he's saying here when he uses this term, a minister, is that this is the one that God has used in order to put into effect his truth in these people's life. Paul and others are being used in this way. And he says this, this epistle that they represent, that their lives manifest, has not been written with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Now, remember, most of the time when I speak of the Spirit, I always recommend that we remember what is said in the book of Genesis, how the Spirit of God brings order. And this is important because the validation of Paul's ministry is seen in the order, the order of God, the purposes of God, the objectives of God that's being realized. How? In these people's lives, in the congregation at Corinth. So this is what he's revealing. He's saying you can see the validation, the authority. My recommendation as a shaliach, as an apostle, in how these people are living because the order of God is being manifested. And this comes not because of, of some ink. Now, he's referring to ink as writing a letter, a letter of recommendation. He says, I don't need that because my recommendation not, does not come through ink, but by means of the Spirit, the Spirit of the living God. And it has not been written on tablets of stone, but in the tablets of a human hearts. Now, the word here for human is literally the word for a fleshly heart, but it's speaking about a human heart. So he says, not on tablets of stone. Now, when you hear tablets of stone, what comes into your mind? Obviously, the tablets, the the Ten Commandments, the law of God. And he's saying, and this is going to lay the foundation, he's saying that the tablets, he's going to say they are glorious, they, they reveal the righteousness of God, but here's something very important. They are not an instrument for making one righteous. They define righteousness, but they do not impart righteousness to an individual. This is what he says repeatedly throughout his other epistles. So we read, it has not been written with ink, but rather with the spirit of the living God, not upon tablets of stone, but in the tablets of human hearts. And because of that, looked at verse four, because of that, Paul says, but we, we have confidence such as this, that through Messiah and before God. So he's saying, we're confident in what we have done. The gospel that we are proclaiming, the ministry that we are doing, we have confidence. 
And this confidence comes to us through Messiah, that he is working in us and through us. It's his ministry being done, and we have this confidence as we stand in the presence of God. Verse 5. Now, even though they have this confidence, it is not a confidence that is rooted in pride or self-exaltation. Notice what he says in verse 5. But not that we of ourselves are sufficient. He says, recognizing as, as something from ourselves, meaning this. We're nothing just from ourselves. He wants to call our attention back to what he said. All of this has come by means of the Spirit, and this is the Spirit of Messiah. And it's the manifestation of the Spirit, His work, what the Spirit of God accomplishes in others that is the validation, that is His letter of recommendation, that, that manifests his call as an apostle that gives him this confidence. So he says, not that we ourselves are sufficient ones, reasoning that, that we are something from ourselves, but, second part of verse 5, but our sufficiency is from God. So Paul is just emphasizing that he is an instrument of God. And the reason why he can be an instrument, a minister of God, is because he's trusting in the word of God, the truth of God, applying it to their life, speaking it boldly and correctly. And all of that comes from Messiah. He's not asking for any praise. He says all praise goes to, to God. He's the one. That, that the sufficiency is found in, not of ourselves. He says that twice. So the sufficiency is not ours, but from God, verse 6. Now, verse 6 is a very important verse in this section. It is where there is a transition. We're going to begin this, this issue, this secondary issue, which is really the primary one, it comes to number two in the text, but it's really at the heart of what Paul wants to convey to these readers. And it's where the controversy for some begin. And let me just simply say, we need to always, I need to do this, you need to do it, everyone does. See, we are oftentimes highly affected by our past. We bring ourselves and the baggage that we have in our lives to the text. And we need to be disciplined enough, mature enough, objective enough to not uh, hear things in light of our past, but to accept what he's saying in the original context, to the audience that he was speaking to, and according to the words of the text. So many times people, they have a, a preconceived thought that will either cause them to agree when they ought not or cause them to disagree when they, they should agree. So we need to be careful here. And also not misunderstand what I'm saying or what Paul is saying. So look again, verse, verse 6. He says, who also made sufficient us. So he's speaking, and the who here is God. God in the person of Messiah. He writes, who, this is God, also. He's made us, made us ministers. Ministers of what? Ministers of a new covenant. Now, we talked about last week how important forgiveness is. And when we are unforgiving, I hope you remember the principle, when we are unforgiving, it, it gives an invitation to our adversary, Hasatan, Satan, 
to, to get an advantage over us. And he takes advantage of every, every opportunity that, that we afford him. So we need to not be ignorant of the plans, the schemes of our enemy. Look carefully of what, what Paul is writing. He says in this scripture, He also made us sufficient as ministers of a new covenant. And this covenant, it is unique because one of its primary uh, characteristics is that of forgiveness. We are ministers of a new covenant, not by the letter, but by by the Spirit. And this is very important because there's an emphasis. The emphasis is on the Spirit. And let me say something to you. One of the passages of Scripture that Judaism sees as very, very significant to the extent that we read it every day in the synagogue is from the book of Isaiah. And I would invite you to do what I'm doing. Open up your Bibles to the book of Isaiah and chapter 59. The book of Isaiah and chapter 59. Look with me, if you would, to verse, verse 20. Now, we've encountered this before. I frequently refer to this verse where it says, The Redeemer, he will come to Zion, and he will turn, meaning it's a form of, of causing to repent from transgression in Jacob. He'll turn away the transgression in Jacob, meaning in Israel, declares the Lord. Verse 21. And I, who's speaking, it's God, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit, which will be upon you, and my words, which I will set in your mouth, will not depart from your mouth, and the mouth of your, your offspring, and from the mouth of your offspring's offsprings, says the Lord, from now until forevermore. Now, what I want you to see here is that there's a connection between redemption, this Redeemer, who is obviously Messiah, and the giving forth through a covenant of the Spirit. Remember what he says. We read here about the Redeemer coming to Zion that's going to turn away the transgression from, from Israel, from Jacob, verse 21. And I, this, and this word zot in Hebrew, we translated this, but when this word appears in this, this form, in this grammatical construction within a sentence, it's speaking about the primary thing. This is my covenant with them, says the Lord. What is the primary? My spirit, which will be upon you. So when we speak of a covenant of redemption, the spirit of God, he figures greatly in this. So Paul has just said, he has been by the sufficiency of God through Messiah. He has been made a minister of the gospel. And we read in this passage that this, this gospel concerns, notice what he says, ministers of a new covenant. And this covenant has its power not in the letter, but in the spirit. And this spirit, he brings order into our life, godly order. And then he says, and this was our call to worship tonight, for the letter kills. And he's talking here about the Torah. Now, does this mean the Torah is bad, that we should set it aside, that we ought not read it? It's not for a New Testament believer? Absolutely, absolutely not. But here's what he's saying. The Torah in and of itself, applied to humanity, will bring death. It announces God's judgment. Why? 
Because the Torah, the Torah manifests to us the standards of God. It teaches us the proper definition of righteousness. I know what is righteous and I know what is unrighteous by means of the Torah, the law, the commandments of God. Secondly, and Paul writes this, for example, in Romans, when a person studies the Torah, and you ought to, it has great relevance today. When a person studies the Torah, and, and this person encounters God's commands, those commands, when we apply them to our life, we find out that we are unrighteous, that we are heading for death, condemnation, judgment. And within the Torah, there is a message of hope, one that comes through faith in the grace of God. So the Torah tells me I'm a sinner, I am heading for eternal destruction, that I am not living a life that meets God's standards and therefore punishment, judgment is coming. But also within the Torah, I learn the principles of redemption. And I learn that there is a redeemer. I learn that there is hope through the work of redemption by means of Messiah. And through Messiah, we can become a recipient of redemption. That means also, as we saw in Isaiah 59, verse 21, also the spirit. So he writes here, for the letter kills. If that's all we have is the commandments, and we trust in the commandments for salvation, we will find death. But he says, the spirit, literally, it's a word for life, and the word makes, makes life. And we need to see that in the fullest sense. It is wrong. It is inadequate, insufficient, for us to hear that, he makes life and only understand that for after death, in the world to come, in, in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's true. That spirit, the Holy Spirit, when we receive him by means of receiving the gospel, we are going to have eternal life in the kingdom of God. That is a fact. But when he says makes life, it implies from the moment that you believe, which means my faith, my faith now is going to impact not just my eternal future, but right now, today, tomorrow, next week, next year, for as long as I'm in this body. The Spirit, He functions within me now in this present age. This is what He wants us to realize. So again, the letter kills, but the Spirit makes alive, verse 7. But since ministers of death in the letter, having been engraved in stones. Now, he's saying, and it's a different word. Earlier, we talked about having been written, and it's just that, having been written. Now we have a change in vocabulary to not simply being written, but being engraved. And, and Paul's going to begin, he's already started this contrast. The contrast between the old and the new, the letter and the spirit, that which is written and was glorious, but that glory is going to be surpassed by a greater glory that comes through this new covenant by means of redemption and the ministry of the Spirit. So he says, but since this ministry of death, which is written by or, or in the, the letter, having been engraved in stones, it brought about glory. And it did. It is glorious. So realize, hear what I'm saying. Here's what Paul's saying. The, the 
commandments, the Torah, the law of God, was written in tablets, in stones, having been engraved, and it had a degree of glory. So the law of God, the commandments of God, according to Paul, have a degree of glory, the very glory of God. If someone rejects that, disagrees with that, they are not biblically sound based upon the writings of Paul. Paul clearly says, and I want to get it right, what he mentions. Some say the word if, but if the ministry of death in the letter, which has been engraved in stones, brought about, came about in glory, so that the children of Israel were not able to look, to gaze upon the face of Moses. Now think about this. What Paul is saying here is the, the ministry of the law, that which was written, engraved in tablets, in stone. If it had, and it did, a measure of glory to the extent that the children of Israel were not able to look, notice what it says, not able to gaze into the face of Moses on account of the glory of his face. And then it says, this glory is what? Well, there's a very important word. And this is the word, kat argeo. Kat argeo is a word that is very, very difficult for English speakers and most believers to, to put their, their, wrap their mind around. Now, it's a word, it's oftentimes translated as annulling or disappearing or fading away, losing significance, something along those lines. But, but here's something which is very important. When we're going to look at it, it speaks about a present condition, something that is happening right now, but it is not in its fullness yet. So that which is being annulled, there is a change. And that change eventually is going to be in effect totally, but it hasn't happened yet. There is a lessening, there is a fading away, there is a temporary setting aside, but not permanently. This is going to have still relevance or implications to it. Now, eventually, in the future, it will have no relevancy. It will be done away with, but it's not yet. And that's why he says that it's fading away, but it has not. So what is he speaking about? He's speaking about the Torah. Realize something. And here again, for, for many people, their theology, what they've been taught by others, causes them to not be able to perceive correctly what the Word of God says about the millennial kingdom. So what do they do in order to give them peace of mind, a false peace of mind, they simply say, we don't believe in the millennial. Because what the word of God says about the millennial, what will be happening there, how God will be, be ruling, it doesn't fit with our theology, so we just have to deny it. Not a proper thing to do. What we see here is this, that the law, the commandments of God are not in full functioning today. How do I mean that? Well, let's take, for example, Shabbat. Is there anyone who is hearing my voice? Or do you know anyone who is stating today as a believer that if someone violates the Shabbat, that they should be put to death. I don't know of anyone who 
is, is preaching that. Let's go out and kill anyone who does not keep the Shabbat. What Judaism teaches, and I believe that, that believers need to also affirm, is that in this time allotment, because there's no temple, and there's some other reasons, that it is not possible for Shabbat to be kept according to what the Word of God says about keeping Shabbat. For example, for Shabbat to be kept, there had to be sacrifices offered up on the Sabbath day. Read the book of Numbers chapter 28. Well, there's not an altar. There's not a temple. There's not a functioning priesthood. But does that mean that Shabbat loses all significance? I would strongly argue there is still relevancy in Shabbat. The Shabbat teaches us many things that we can learn and properly apply to our life. This is true for all the commandments of the Scripture. And that's why if someone says that I teach that, that believers need to keep the Torah, never have I said that. No one can keep the Torah today. In fact, Orthodox Judaism says the Torah, Moses' laws, and how they are written in the Scripture. Orthodox Judaism has set them aside for a variety of reasons and now have embraced the Torah of man. That is the, the rabbinical law, what they call the Torah de Rabbanan, not the Torah of Moses. So no one says that I know that has any understanding of, of the Torah itself says that people should be keeping it as it's written. It's an impossibility to do so. But that does not mean that there's no longer relevance. It is wise to read and study the entire Torah. And I'm speaking about the first five books of the Bible. And those instructions on what it says that we should do. What does the scripture tell us? That we need to study that, learn that, and then apply the message of the commandment the righteousness of the law to our life. And by means of the Spirit, and hopefully you know what verse I'm going to go to, Romans 8, 4. Those who walk not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, fulfill the righteousness of the law. Now, this is all going to come together because notice what he says. Let's go back to, to verse 7. But if... The ministry of death in the letter, engraved in stones, brought about in glory, so that the sons of Israel were not able to gaze upon the face of Moses on account of the glory of his face, which was what? Fading away. That glory that was there, it, it got less over time. He says, look at verse 8, how much more so, and it's a question for, is it not even greater the ministry of the Spirit which will be in glory? Now, it has glory now, but the future. See, here's the, the thing that Paul is doing. The ministry of the law had glory to the effect that it changed the face of Moses. But that glory was fading away ever so slowly, but it, dis it lessened. But the glory of the Spirit, it is going to grow greater and greater and greater until it reaches its full measure. So one is lessening, the other is growing in its glory. Verse 9. For if the ministry of condemnation was of glory, how much more abundance, and here's what I like, and I would 
highlight this. In fact, I did in my Bible. It says, the ministry of righteousness. Now, realize something. It is so significant that Paul never calls the Torah. Although the Torah is righteous, it defines what righteousness is. It is good. It is pleasing. It has glory attached to it. All of those things. But the Torah does not produce, it is not an instrument of righteousness. I take the Torah and I apply it to my life as a non-believer. And what does it show? I am unrighteous. And because I'm unrighteous, it brings about death. It brings about the curse. It lets me know that's my future. I don't want to be cursed. I don't want to die eternally. So what happens? The Torah also tells me there is the concept of redemption and a redeemer. So the Torah tells me, manifests to me, my need of redemption and causes me to look and seek for that redeemer, that one that can help me. I can't help myself. So I seek the one who is going to help me become righteous. And it's the righteousness of Messiah that is imparted to me when I believe. And therefore, and that comes through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Spirit of God. So he writes here, look at verse 9. For if the ministry of condemnation is of glory, how much more so? And the word is, in abundance is the ministry of righteousness in glory. Verse, verse 10. Now, verse 10 is a very hard verse to translate literally. What he's simply saying is this. If, and the context is this. If this ministry that Paul calls of condemnation, condemning, if this had a degree of glory, having been glorified, but its glorification was just in part, it wasn't full, it was proportional. And it is going to be set aside. Why? For, he says, on account of a surpassing glory. And what is that? The glory of the Spirit. Now learn something. Judaism says the Torah is eternal. It is not. We cannot simply, like these buzz, buzz statements, and, and embrace them. We need to always rely upon Scripture. The Torah is going to be utilized by Messiah in the millennial kingdom. It is going to be the Torah, the commandments of God, is going to be what Messiah uses to rule over the millennial kingdom. But when that millennial kingdom comes to an end, and there's the transition into the final state of the kingdom of God, the new Jerusalem, realize something. It is emphasized at the end of the book of Revelation, that in the New Jerusalem, there is no temple. In the Millennial Kingdom, yes, there's a temple. But there is no temple in the New Jerusalem. Why? Because at that time, that law which is becoming obsolete, fading away, being annulled, will be annulled, obsolete, done away with, faded away in the New Jerusalem but we're not there yet. And that's why he speaks and uses the term that he does. What term? Well, first of all, let's look at verse, verse 10 again. He says, For even that which has been made glorious, being glorious in, in part, it says, but... It is surpassed by greater glory. That's the implication. And what's that greater glory? 
this new covenant which is not based in the letter but based in the spirit verse 11 verse 11 is going to be our last verse for if that which is fading away pay attention it says here it's in the present it is a present participle passive which means god is at work god is moving in order that that first covenant based upon the letter that is passing it is becoming obsolete but it has not yet not in our lifetime not in this age not in this dispensation and not in the millennial kingdom only in the new jerusalem but he tells us if it's fading away that which is fading away okay, through glory it has glory but it's fading away then he says and this is the second time he uses a similar phrase much more much more that which remains is in glory and what is remaining the new covenant why the new covenant that word new and again i repeat myself and it always frustrates me because for example we were at our study center here in israel and i ask sometimes the same question over and over and i get different answers i don't get what we've learned and that's why it's so necessary to repeat when you hear the term new as a new covenant the word new based upon what it says at the end of the book of revelation when john glimpses at the new jerusalem and he says behold all things are new what was he speaking about the kingdom the term new relates to a kingdom it is a main adjective that describes the kingdom of god so when he speaks of that which is in glory that surpasses that which remains he's speaking about the kingdom of god which has a reality for you and me by means of a covenant a covenant relates to promise so the new covenant has kingdom promises and the kingdom promises begin to work in our life we begin to experience them in measure by means of the work of the Holy Spirit. So Paul is not saying that the letter is, is bad. It has glory. But that glory is departing, it's fading, it's becoming obsolete. But that which relates to the Spirit of God, it is eternal. And its glory surpasses the glory of the old important words and we'll continue in this same discussion next week because the last part of chapter 3 paul wants to speak about these same truths that there's no misunderstanding no confusion that we understand properly the wonderful covenant that messiah has made available to you and to me shalom from israel well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.